after playing this game for the past two weeks straight, I have collected 25 tips, tricks, and combat secrets for Lords of the Fallen. I got everything from insane farming spots to secret tips directly from the developers themselves. Yes sir, after this video, you'll be pulling out badass moves like this. Alrighty then, let's jump right into it. As you begin playing, you will inevitably meet our dear friend, the Mimic. Oh my goodness! But I'ma give you the forbidden knowledge that you need to see through his trickery. So normal items will look like this, with a straight tail. Meanwhile, this scumbag looks like this. See, his tail is more wispy, as if he's waving, trying to lure you in. Wispy tail? Don't touch it. Don't even look at it. The developers have stated that they designed dual wielding and two handing a weapon for different purposes. They said that two handing a weapon is meant for dealing heavy damage on a single individual target. Meanwhile, dual wielding weapons is better for dealing with a group of enemies. Because the dual wield moveset usually consists of wide area swings, great for crowd control. When it comes to blocking attacks and parrying, the heavier shields and bigger weapons have stronger defense, yes, but their window of time for parries are shorter. Small weapons like dual wielding daggers have the longest and most generous parry window. So, the bigger the shield or weapon, the shorter its parry window time is. Meanwhile, smaller weapons have the longest parry windows, though they have the weakest defensive protection. Hey yo, check it out, we got status effects in this game. Let's go, baby! They can be quite deadly if used correctly. We got bleed, burn, poison, smite, ignite, and frostbite. Here I have the full explanation of all the damage types and exactly what these status effects do. Now this is straight from the developers, so go ahead and pause the video if you want to read about what the status buildup effects actually do. In general, dual wielding two weapons can be more effective at proccing status effects compared to a single weapon, especially considering the fact that when applying salts, one use of it will apply the buff to both weapons, giving you a two for one deal, double the increase in status buildup. You should know that heavy attacks do not necessarily do more damage than light attacks. Typically, they are similar speeds and deal the same damage numbers, but heavy attacks deal more posture damage. This is why they are valuable, plus they can be charged up. So when you do perform a fully charged heavy, that will indeed deal higher damage numbers and it is certainly way more effective at breaking down posture. Light attacks are meant for quick damage, while heavies are meant for staggering and breaking poise you'll notice that the damage numbers you deal are either red, white, or kinda grayed out. When they are red, this signifies that the attack you're using is dealing more damage than normal towards that enemy. White signifies the damage is about regular, and grayed out numbers means your attacks are quite underpowered against that enemy. Now, which color you get is a result of multiple factors. So, you may be getting red numbers because you're using a damage type that the enemy is vulnerable to, or you could just be way over leveled for that area. And the opposite could be the case if you're seeing grayed out numbers. Grayed numbers could mean that the enemy might have a resistance to your weapon's damage type, or that area might be way above your pay grade, and you gotta level up first. Just to make it very clear, you have two forms of dodge in this game, and they have different purposes. You tap the button once, and you sidestep or backstep. This game is all about that backstep, my boy. We, we. Because this is really what you want to be using to dodge and evade attacks, as it will keep you within range to quickly follow up with your own counterattack. And then, double tapping the button makes you roll far away. The purpose of this is to create some distance and actually disengage you from the fight if you feel like you need to take a breather and get some personal space. So yeah, they do indeed have different purposes. For simply evading attacks, just the skip is best. 
This here is the best farming spot that I know of so far. Right at the Pilgrim Perch, Beldor Vestige. So here's how you do it. You soul flay this barnacle head right here. You light him up easy, and then you rest at the prestige, rinse and repeat. It's literally it. This dude alone gives you over 500 souls. And I timed it. You can kill him in under 30 seconds, easy. Which means if you grind out the farm, you can make over a thousand vigor per minute. 1000 vigor, man, every minute consistently. Now that was the beginner's farm right consistent simple easy but i have an even better more advanced farming technique that can give you big boy money yeah. donald dump money you know what i'm saying if you have the skills to pull it off so these pimped out grim reapers and i know they are ridiculous to defeat but if you do he will drop you 25,000 vigor you can repeat this a few times and yeah now if you have a friend this will be much, much easier, as one of you can take his aggro while the other attacks him from his booty. And boom, one spray painted Grim Reaper dead. Something the game does not explicitly tell you is how to increase your maximum ammunition and mana pools. Well, raising your vitality and endurance levels will increase your ammunition bar while raising your radiance and inferno levels both will increase your maximum mana. When you come across situations where you need to pass over an umbral bridge, you don't always need to totally switch realms. Quite often, you can simply use the lamp to animate just the ground you are walking on, as long as you don't get interrupted and slapped by an enemy. In this game, even a single dude attacking you from a distance can prove to be problematic. Archers and spellcasters equals pain and suffering. So when fighting a mob, always, always target the ranged enemy first. There's usually some fucking dingbat shooting arrows or throwing molotovs or just throwing some random shit at you. And you end up catching those molotovs with the back of your head. So do yourself a favor, before taking on the big boys, target any ranged type enemy first. Cause they will be the death of you. You should know that the weapon you place in your main hand will dictate what type of moveset you'll have when you're dual wielding. See here, we got an axe and a spear. They will both have the same light attacks, but they will not have the same heavy attacks. As you see here, their charged heavy attacks are different, plus their running heavy attacks are also different. So even though it's essentially the same exact stats and damage, power stancing the same weapons, which weapon you put in your main hand will make a difference for your style of attack combos. You can buy Vestige Seeds from Magical Humpty Dumpty here, but they aren't cheap, so try to use them sparingly. You can only keep one Vestige up at a time, so try to be as efficient as you can with planting seeds. Always keep two or three on stock for your journey. Trust me, you will thank me later. Constantly be propping up your umbral lamp everywhere you go. Be on the lookout for any hidden doors or puzzles or bridges. They could be anywhere. You never know when you will randomly find an umbral puzzle or a door that might lead you to an awesome weapon or item. One time I did an umbral puzzle and I got this random item that apparently gives you one minute of big brick energy when consumed. So yeah, you don't want to miss out on something like that. Telling you to use your consumable items would be a very obvious tip, but something specific I have for you is the Withering Resistance Ward. See, all the other wards are only for specific enemies. You know, fire type, frostbite, holy. You only find those damage types in certain areas. But the wither resistance wards can be useful everywhere. Let me explain. So you get hit with the most withered damage while in umbral. And you will be entering the umbral zone throughout the game. In any location at any time. And shit gets real in the umbral zone man. Shit gets real. You're definitely gonna want some wither resistance to help. Therefore, Wither Resistance Wards can be useful for you throughout your entire playthrough. So just make sure to prioritize the Wither Wards and keep them on stock and use them often. Through the game, you will pick up these Umbral Eyes, and apparently your lantern has a perfectly sized socket for you to plop a couple of eyeballs into. So at the Magical Humpty Dumpty, you can socket these eyeballs into your lamp for special buffs. 
Socketing runes is another cool mechanic this game offers to further optimize your builds. At the blacksmith, you can socket runes into your weapons. Something like increased inferno attribute, reduce radiant attribute. This will not actually change the letters. It won't go from a B to an A, but it will show the letter as green to signify it's getting a buff, or red to signify a nerf. But as far as we can tell, we believe that the runes that simply increase your damage are more effective than the runes that raise your attribute scaling. By the way, just so you know, you will need to give her rune tablets in order to start socketing these runes. So I'm sure you've already seen Soul Flame being used to yeet enemies off ledges, which is definitely something I recommend you do as much as possible. But you can also use Soul Flame to rip enemies down off of ledges or any high ground. You might not be able to slap their soul around while in the air, but at least they will fall on their face where you can easily finish them off. Always locking on can be bad. Do not make this scrubber dubber newbie mistake. You will definitely want to free aim wide swinging attacks rather than locking on to a single enemy, especially when fighting groups of enemies or in a big boss fight. Also, if you have any AoE blast attacks, like my hefty fireball, you can free aim these downwards as an area attack and you send them bitches flying. Parry everything. You better get your A-game on, baby, because we're parrying everything out here. We're parrying magic spells. We're parrying dragons. We're parrying Thomas the goddamn train, man. We par Are you sure about that? All right, maybe not. Maybe not everything. But definitely don't be afraid to try and parry. This game is not as punishing as other games when it comes to missing parries. See, all you have to do is time your block correctly. So if you don't time it correctly, you will just end up blocking the attack like normal. I mean, that's it. There is very little risk involved. So might as well try it. Parrying doesn't automatically mean you can get a critical strike. Things like charged heavy attacks, kicks, and parrying will slowly break down the enemy's posture. Now when the enemy's posture has totally depleted, you then have to perform another parry or kick move to actually stagger them down. If you are a bow and arrow extraordinaire and you like slinging bolts from afar, you should know that there is a headshot buff in this game. Mm -hmm. Landing headshots do indeed deal extra damage. So maybe when you're surprised attacking a bigger enemy, target that noggin. I have a quick settings tip. If you're having frame rate problems, your FPS is dropping, choppy gameplay, try going full screen and turning on VSync. This will help with performance. And also, there has been talk that the game has a memory leak at the moment because the frame rate dropping just gets worse and worse over time as you play. But you can fix this by restarting the game. It will reset, which should refresh and fix the problem. And my last tip of the day, I highly recommend that you drop a fat like on this video if you made it this far and comment any tips that you have, any tricks of your own. Please share in the comment section below. Thank you for watching.